All right. I see some of you that I don't know. So for those of you who've not yet met me, uh, my name's Lisa Shaver. I'm the youth leader here at Woodland. Normally, I'm not the person who gives the message. That would be Pastor John over there. But because of it being graduation Sunday, um, I have a message aimed particularly at the high school seniors that are headed off into a new stage of their life. But hopefully... Uh, the words of God can be applicable to all of us here. So seniors, as you enter this next stage of your life, you're going to have to make many decisions about who you are. You've already had to make decisions about if you're going to attend college and what school you're going to attend, if you're going to work during school, or if you're going to work instead of school, if you're going to live at home or on campus or in an apartment. And each of these decisions that you're making right now says something about who you are at this very moment. And these decisions are going to have a tremendous impact upon who you become in the next few years. And in college, you're going to make even more decisions. You're going to decide what you're going to major in, what classes you'll take, who you'll spend your time with, which professors are going to mentor you. And maybe like me, you'll even meet the person you're going to marry during your time at school. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> For those of you going into middle school or those of you going into high school, you'll have some other decisions to make. What extracurriculars to participate in, how to dress, what sports to participate in, what friends to hang out with, what music to listen to. And each one of you is going to have an opportunity to define yourself among your peers by these choices. A New York Times article written in October called The Year We Obsessed Over Identity pinpoints many of the crises related to identity that we struggled with in 2015 as a nation. The article pinpoints racial identity and gender identity of two of the major topics of last year. Topics that I think all of us can agree are still at the forefront of news, social media, and conversations. And as I read the article, it made me think of each of you students that God has given me the gift of working with this past year. And because, you're, because as you're coming of age, the world around you is in a massive identity crisis. And I know, I know that each of you it, are having a hard time not getting sucked into the game of identifying yourself based on your gender, your political beliefs, the way you dress, the hobbies you enjoy, the color of your skin, the friends you choose, the school you go to, the sports you play. And I'm sure you can name a million other things that you could identify yourselves by. And so today, while we as a church recognize the new stages of life each of you are entering, I want to remind you of who you are as believers in Christ. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into Scripture together. Father God, thank you for hearing us. We know that you always hear us, and it blows our minds to think that the God of the universe cares to listen to us. Thank you for being present with us. You are a good Father who does not abandon his children, but instead would lay down your Son for us. Help us to love you well, that we might show the world what it means to be your loved and adored children who have been given new life by the resurrection of your Messiah. As we look at the book of Hebrews this morning, let us truly, as the author of this book encourages us, draw near to you, God, to live lives of faithfulness, to grasp our identity as those you have saved from the curse of sin and death. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truth and life in your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, if all of you would turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews 10, we'll be starting at verse 19 and going through the end of the chapter. So as you're getting there, let's talk a little bit about the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is intimidating to me because Hebrews is generally considered the most academic book of the Bible, and I am certainly not the most academic person in this room right now. <laughs> the reason it's considered the most academic book is because the language, the grammatical structure, and the allusions that the author of the book of Hebrews make come from someone who was extremely well-educated. 
Now, no one actually knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some have speculated that it might be Paul, although that conclusion has been widely disregarded at this point because the style of language doesn't match with the other things that Paul has written. One of the uh, largest theories right now is that Achilla and Priscilla, a couple that encouraged Paul in his ministry, wrote the book of Hebrews together. We don't know if that's true or not. It probably is someone we hear about in the New Testament, but the author never identifies him or herself. We do know that it was written to Jewish people who were suffering from social persecution. Now, they weren't being beaten and they weren't being killed, but this was bad social persecution. It's not like they were just being made fun of. They were being kicked out of their towns. They were having their property and their belongings taken from them. This was pretty serious. And so, as a response to this, these former Jews are considering reverting to Judaism for social protection. They don't want their things taken from them. They would like to keep their homes. And so they're thinking, okay, if we just go back to obeying the law and living a Jewish lifestyle, no one will bother us. And so, the author of Hebrews is writing to them to tell them that Jesus is so much better. Jesus is so much better than the lifestyle that they had been experiencing before they had encountered Jesus. And so the author of Hebrews goes through several things that Jesus is better than. Jesus is better than angels. He's better than the patriarchs that the Jewish people ascribe to. And Jesus offers better things than the Jewish religion or any other lifestyle, for that matter, can offer. Now, in this particular passage that we're looking at today, the point that the writer of Hebrews makes is that the life Jesus offers is better. And better than what? Well, it's better than anything. This new Jesus-centered life is better than the life these former Jews once lived, which is what the author focuses on. But what I say to each one of you here is that the Jesus-centered life that we now experience as those who follow him is better than anything. Now, the passage that we're looking at today is sort of divided into three chunks. So let's take it one piece at a time. So read along with me from verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the faith we profess, for he who promised is faithful." And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, the author asserts that we as believers can now enter the most holy place through the blood of Christ, who is our priest. Now, the youth have been studying 1 Samuel on Wednesday nights. And we've learned a lot about priesthood. Elena, can you tell me what the job of a priest is? Right. The job of a priest is to talk to God on behalf of the people and to make sacrifices. And the reason for those sacrifices is to atone for the sins of the people to God. So the entire job of the priest is to intercede for the people of God to God. So, essentially, the priest gave people access to God. Now, the writer of Hebrews asserts that Christ is the best priest because not only does he intercede to God on our behalf, but his sacrifice has given us access to God in a way that no other priest could accomplish. Because when Christ died on the cross, the curtain to the temple is torn in two, And the people of God are welcomed into the place where God's presence was most concentrated and most felt. And then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is God with us at all times, in all places. So in Christ's death and resurrection, 
He has rendered defunct the system of Levitical law. And now we, we all have access to God, direct access. So because Christ has accomplished this work, dear brothers and sisters, let us hold to the hope of eternal life. That is Christ now within us. Now, the way in which we hold to this hope, the author of Hebrews tells us, is by remembering what Christ has done for us in washing us clean of our sin and making us pure in God's sight. And moreover, the way we hold to this hope is by meeting together with other believers for the purpose of encouraging one another. And even more as the day of Christ's return draws near. This means, essentially, go to church. And don't just show up as soon as it starts and leave immediately afterwards, but get to know your church family. Spend time with them. Talk to them. Go to lunch together. Pray for each other. Share your story with each other. Now, seniors, when you go to college, there will be weekends when you will actually have too much homework to go to church. In fact, you will find most weekends you will have too much homework to go to church and certainly too much homework to hang around afterwards building relationships with other Christians. But your identity is not in a 4.0 GPA. Your identity is in Christ. And so if you fail to turn in a homework assignment because you will not give up meeting together with other believers, then that is okay. Because Jesus is better than straight A's. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do your best in school. By all means, stay up all night on Sunday to finish some papers. But don't use your schoolwork as an excuse to abandon fellowship with other believers. Now, in contrast, we'll pick up in verse 26, and you can read along with me again. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice is left for sins, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Now, this is the reverse of that first chunk of scripture we looked at. We have now two categories of people. We have those who draw near to God and those who are enemies of God. And there is no middle ground here. The idea is that if we are not drawing nearer to God, and instead we are persistently sinning and living in a way that a child of God should not be living, then our salvation is not genuine, And we are fully deserving of the wrath of God. If we have seen the goodness of God, if we have heard the message of Christ's death and resurrection, which gives life to all who believe, and we do not participate in that life, then we have spit in the face of God, and he will judge us for that choice. And it is indeed a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God whom you have insulted. But I don't want to spend too much time on this middle section here. And the reason I don't want to do that is because that's not the author's primary focus. So let's read on in verse 32. Remember those earlier days, after you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict full suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come 
and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. The entire point, then, of the author of Hebrews describing those enemies of God was to make the point that that's not who we are. The Jewish believers that the author of Hebrews wrote to had endured persecutions before. They'd already been through that. And they can do it again because their hope and their identity is in Christ. They are not the ones who will fall into the hands of the living God. And we, as those who now follow Jesus Christ, are likewise not the ones who will be destroyed. So that is who we are not, but let's talk about who we are. And verse 39 states it really plainly. We are those who have faith and are saved. And so those Jewish believers knew that should their homes, their social standing, their jobs and their pride be stripped away, who they are to the core will remain. They are those who belong to Christ. I've watched as far too many of my dear friends have left for college, careers, a gap year overseas, and abandon Christ when they encounter any sort of social persecution. Could be as simple as saying, someone saying, oh, You believe in Jesus? Well, that's dumb. And it breaks my heart that now they're enemies of God who are bound for judgment should they not repent. And I think of the lives that they used to live and realized that Jesus was always a side dish for them. Their identity was always in being a good student, having a sharp sense of humor, being an athlete, being a good daughter, or friend, or mom, their love of traveling. And none of those are bad things. But the problem was, that was who they were. That was it. That was all they were. And church was a nice social experience when it fit into their schedules. But they were not those who belonged to Christ. They belonged to the world. Friends, Jesus isn't a side dish. Jesus is better than anything else. And if he's not where you place your identity, then your identity is in a false God who can offer you no hope and no life. The reason for the hope that is within me is that Christ lived as a man on this earth a perfect life without sin. And so he paid the price for my sin by dying on a cross so that I am no longer condemned to separation from God. But now I can be called a friend of God. And you too, you here who have faith and are saved, you are friends of God. You are those who have been redeemed from the curse of sin and death. You, who were once enemies of God, are now his children and co-heirs with Christ of his kingdom. You have been bought with a price. You have been sanctified. You have been reconciled to your creator. You are citizens of a kingdom that is not of this world. I have a good friend named Matt who is just a massive coffee snob, and I'm sure some of you in this room know people like that. Maybe you are people like that. Um, And he was speaking once about why the things of the world don't interest him. And he said, to him, the things of the world are like Starbucks coffee. He's had better. And you, as those who are saved, have had better than the things of this world. You who are going off to college and being told this is a time to explore and experiment with who you are and do all these worldly and sinful things, you have had better than that. And don't forget that. Don't forget that Jesus is better than that. And so seniors 
and the rest of you. I don't want to send you off into the world with clever words or a challenge. But rather, I plead with you that if your identity is not in Christ, that you change that today. In a minute here, Larry's going to come up and play a song, and John and Suzanne will be up here ready to celebrate with you if today is the day that your identity is placed in Jesus Christ. And I urge you not to leave here unsure if you are an enemy of God or if you are one who belongs to Christ. Lord, you are life. And in you, there is no darkness. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. And we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us. Conform us to the image of your son and create in us clean hearts that we may act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you. Let us understand our position in Christ and that our union with him gives us life, hope, and peace. Let those whose hearts are restless find their rest in you. Amen.